working in uh, National University of Singapore now for almost 27 years. And I'm quite happy to be part of this, uh, this program. And the focus of my talk today will be on the lightweight, environmentally conscious magnesium-based material for mitigating major environmental pollution, because these are the main issues. Magnesium-based materials are the next generation of lightweight material, which you people will see in very near future. It has already been there in many applications, and but the awareness of people in many countries are still not to that level as in some of the advanced countries. So I'm sure that all of you will benefit a lot from what you will see in this presentation. Magnesium is not a uh, material which is new per se. It's, it has almost a hundred year old history with its best use first surface during the Second World War. So if you see this picture on the left hand side, you see that all these ladies here are using magnesium based material for, for the applications such as in the tracer bullets, bombs, and the lightweight equipment. Now, notice the word lightweight equipment, because that time the fossil fuels were in short supply between the countries and lightweight concept was first being launched during the Second World War and now in the 21st century. Now, in 1947, we have seen the application of magnesium-based materials in the aerospace sector. And in 1950, we have seen its application in the transportation sector. So defense sector, transportation sector, per se is billion dollar sector, which is extremely important for the economy of any country, especially the big countries like India. Now in context of the modern time, when you choose a material, it has to take in few things actually. First thing, it has to be abundant because only when it is abundant, then you can sustain that technology. Number two, it should be non-toxic because if you use a toxic material, like we have used many toxic material in the last century, and what we face now is spending billions of dollars to clean up our land, to clean up our water bodies, and also cleaning up our air. So ideally speaking, the material should be non-toxic. We don't want to keep contaminating our planet so that it will not be inhabitable for our future generation. And when we grow old, we will have serious health problems. The material should have acceptable properties and that depends on the end applications. It should be cost friendly. If the benefit of a material has to reach a common man, it cannot be too expensive. If it is too expensive, its applications are limited and a common man is not able to see the benefit of it. The material should not have any geopolitical issues. That means you should have a multiple sources of supply of the material. If your material is wonderful, but it is available only in one country, and tomorrow you have some political issues with that country, and they stop the supply of this material to you, all your industries goes down the drain, and you cannot do anything about it. So it's better to use a material which has multiple sources. So if one source closes, you can get it from other sources. So magnesium is one of the element which ticks all these points. Now, so why we should use magnesium besides the points I have indicated? It is very important material for a happy planet Earth, for happy plants, for happy humans, and also for the happy animals. Let's look at the planet Earth. Now, I'm sure you people are reading newspaper and you are aware that all of us, all across the world, we are facing the issues of global warming. Chennai, for example, in 2015, December, had flash floods. All the low-lying areas, including IIT Chennai, were partially submerged with the water. Billions of dollars were lost because of this damage to the low-lying industry, the equipment which are at the low levels and all this thing. And in 2019, the same city has seen the uh, drought where millions of uh, barrels of water was transported to Chennai to sort out that issue. We have seen in January 2016 forest fires in Alberta, Canada, where the temperature was minus 10 degrees centigrade. 
at such a low temperature the fire took place because the air was very very dry then we have seen in europe for example in france like 45 degrees centigrade in 2019 now these kind of events are happening now on a very recurrent basis it's not one of events we have seen icebergs like the what you see much bigger than the titanic ship floating in the neighboring countries of the arctic area and this is a reflection of the melting of ice in the arctic circle and that is also attributed to the global warming and because of the thinning of this sheet of the ice now the sunlight can go in and the phytoplanktons are getting active so now you may see the green arctic area rather than the white arctic area in very near future so basically based on all these events which has been recorded very seriously by the researchers all over the world we are able to see now that all the scientists have come to a, a, a conclusion that we cannot let the average temperature rise beyond 2 degrees centigrade when you compare it with the pre-industrial time and the year of the pre-industrial time is 1880 the initial target is to keep it below 1.5 degree centigrade because below 1.5 degree centigrade you can still manage the weather changes for once you go beyond 2 degree centigrade for example if we don't take corrective actions then it, the climate change will be irreversible that means we cannot change anything anymore and that points to the disaster so one of the initial recommendation of the Paris agreement was to cut down the CO2 emission by 2 billion tons by year 2025 so covid-19 as indicated in the earlier talk uh, uh, in the inauguration talk has some positive side effects i will say it's not like we want to have covid-19 in, in our life it has many bad effects but in terms of the planet earth it has done one thing good is that because the transportation sector almost came to a land uh, stand still so it is expected that we may be able to reduce the co2 emission by about 2.5 billion tons by the end of last year of course the data has to come in but that was the expectation so in a way the global temperature has gone down by 0.01 degree centigrade which is quite significant so if you look at the main reason how we can improve the health of planet earth uh, where the atmosphere does not see any international boundaries there are three major sectors which lead to the co2 emission electricity sector transportation sector and the industrial sector of course we are trying our best if you have read the newspaper today one of the uh, nuclear reactor in india which is built by india is operative now so that's a way to cut down on the fossil fuels then you have industrial sector also use of fossil fuels and then one of the biggest sector is the transportation sector of course people are coming with the electrical car battery operated car and, and all the same but one of the way in which you can like really make an impact in the transportation sector because everyone want to have a car everyone want to have a scooter and and all the same everyone want to fly now so it gives us an opportunity to cut down on the co2 emission significantly and very quickly the simple concept is that you reduce the weight of the vehicle whether it's a car or a plane it will burn less fossil fuel if it burn less fossil fuel the co2 emission will go down automatically 2010 european union also got together and they made a target to reduce the fuel consumption by about 25% by year 2020 and we'll see how much they achieve when the report comes out so basically their target was to reduce from 130 g of co2 per kilometer to about 95 g of co2 and uh, that means your average car should give a mileage of about 30 km per liter so these are some of the efforts which are made by the researchers all over the world now how bad we are on the planet earth is what is illustrated in this slide we have already entered a six mass extinction event when we say mass extinction event that means we lose 70 to 95% of living organisms whether it's plants animals or microorganisms 
the first five extinction events were created by nature. The last one I've seen the dinosaur disappear. And we are already in the sixth one now. The CO2 levels in the atmosphere is at the highest in last 800,000 years. And if we do not take a corrective action, we don't see any ice in by 2030 in Arctic Ocean. And once the ice melts, the sea level increases, which is doing it at 3.4 millimeter per year. So all the low-lying countries like Fiji and all this thing, they will disappear. Our coast area will be eroded, so we will lose a significant part of the land. And that may be happening as early as by 2030. Unless we take a corrective action, like some countries are trying to build a concrete wall along their uh, international boundary facing the sea, so that the increase in the sea level does not affect their landmass. We have seen the number of extreme events like droughts, forest fires, floods, and tropical storms that have doubled since 1990s. And practically, you see uh, that every country now and then is reporting unexpected climate changes which are lasting for a longer time. Now, let's try to understand what a doomsday clock. The doomsday clock is that when the minute needle comes to 12, exactly that means it's a sign of disaster for all the living organisms on the planet Earth. The three factors which uh, control this movement of the minute clock is the proliferation of nuclear weapons, climate change, and the new technology. So you see the climate change is so important, new technology is so important, and the proliferation of nuclear weapon, which is quite tightly controlled these days, but we still have one or two rock states which threatens now and then. Now, so let's go into the spiritual part of our life. The Mayan, which is one of the old culture in on this planet, they predicted the end of the world on 21st of December 2012. Nothing really happened at that time, but you see that all the countries were scampering to come together for Paris Agreement because they could see the climate change coming in. And now let's go by the Hindu philosophy of Kali Yuga which is supposed to end in 2025 and that is apparently 2012 to 2025 is practically what I tell to the people is a window given by the God to you to take the corrective action or else or else that means each and every one of, will, of us will be very severely affected and Paris Agreement the scientists are also saying that we had to do something definitely by 2025. So you see that how the scientists and the spirituality, they converge to the year 2025. So we cannot ignore these signatures. Now, unlike the last century when we were growing up, anything new that comes to our life, we, were, we used to be very happy without knowing that whether this thing is made of toxic material or non-toxic material. But the current generation has seen and they are very much aware of the issues like climate change, issues like non-toxicity and everything. Because they are facing some of the effects of that and they are very clear that if they do not take an action now, when they grow old, they will be in a much bad state. So all kind of these processions you will see all the way from UK to USA to uh, African continent, European continent, India, everywhere these kind of protests are happening. Now how magnesium is useful for happy and healthy plants because the work done by Australian researchers have shown that if your soil is contaminated by certain elements, in this case gold and manganese, they can absorb these elements in their system. And once they can absorb this thing, you take the vegetables, no matter how well you wash it, you are still eating the contamination there. Now, each of us know that aluminum is a lightweight material which largely replaced steels in many applications way back in 80s. Most of you were not born at that time. And apparently, but very few people know that aluminum is a neurotoxic element. If aluminum goes in the soil and if the pH of the soil is less than 
the plants can take it. Many plants like buckwheat plant and also other plants, they can take this element in their transportation system. And you'll be surprised that 60% of the world potential crop growing land is highly acidic. So if you want to use aluminum, you have to ensure that you recycle it well. If you don't do that, you may face serious health problems over the time. Now, if magnesium contaminates the system, whether it's the water body or the land bodies, now if you look at the plants on your right hand side, much longer root growth, when the root growth is good, shoot growth will be automatically good. Now, let's try to have a look in perspective of humans and animals. What you see on the image on your left hand side is a dog turning blue in Mumbai because he was drinking the water from a canal which was contaminated. On the left hand side you see an image of Hulk. I'm sure many of you have seen Avengers. His body was contaminated by some chemicals. So what you see is that animals can change colors in the reality and of course this Hulk character is a fictional character. But I'll not be surprised that if we do not control the contamination, maybe humans at some stage will start changing the colors. It is a possibility. It can lead to the gene mutation. You never know. So apparently any kind of pollution is not tolerated, should not be tolerated. And this pollution, because the water pollution, soil contamination, air pollution, they also affect our health in many, many ways. So basically it's something which we want to stay healthy. You can earn money, but if you are not healthy, you cannot do anything. Rajnikanth is wealthy, but he is not healthy. So he has to give up his plans for launching a party. I'm sure you people have seen that news. So how the magnesium is useful for human health? It is involved in 300 chemical reactions in the body. It is required by the muscular system nervous system, cardiovascular system, immunity system. And if you have trouble sleeping, you can take magnesium tablets. It's there in the vegetables, beans, nuts, and also fish. And you will be surprised there's a fourth most abundant cation in the human body and stored in the bone. The daily requirement of magnesium is next to calcium. If you take calcium 650 milligram every day, you need up to 400 milligram of magnesium. So it's something which our body needs. Aluminium, on the other hand, 3.8 million tons were generated in 2017, and out of that, 2.7 million tons were landfilled. That means three-fourths, roughly, of amount of aluminium was landfilled. And as I indicated to you before, that if we don't landfill it properly, it may end up in our dinner plate. And once it happens, it can lead to the cognitive deficiency, dementia, adverse effect on CNS, central nervous system, reproductive system. It's linked with Alzheimer's disease is very well recorded. In fact, in 1995, Australians stopped using aluminum-based salts to treat their water because of the link with the Alzheimer's disease. And the people who are most susceptible to that are the infants, elderly people, and the patient with the impaired renal function. So World Health Organization is continuously trying to reduce the maximum possible intake of the aluminum by any human. Now, for the noise pollution, magnesium can be taken as a medicine also. For example, 15% of the US suffers from tinnitus. Noise pollution is seen in soldiers, workers, and individuals working in the noisy condition. So if you take magnesium with vitamins A, C, and E, you can solve these issues to quite some extent. Magnesium is also emerging as a biomaterial. As I indicated that you need magnesium, it's a nutritional element. So people have used that idea to convert it into like stents. The picture on the top is a stent. And what you see here is the compression screws. So this is for the orthopedic fixation. So what happens when you use this material? You have a crack or a fracture. You use the screws and forget it. You don't have to go for second surgery. And that saves you cost to go to doctor and the trauma that you have to go through when you go to the second surgery because these elements will dissolve in the body. And once the bone is healed within a year, they also will dissolve in the body without any side effects. Electromagnetic pollution is another pollution. Each of us 
or using electronic gadgets. Practically each of us have a mobile phone, we have a TV in the home, we have a refrigerator in the home, we have laptop, we have food processor, anything electric, they generate electromagnetic waves. Is the fifth largest pollution after noise, water, air, and solid pollution. So once you use this device close to your body, it generates current in your body. Once it generates current in the body, your body doesn't know how to take care of it. It affects the metabolism. It affects the hormone production. And that is why it leads to cancer. So that is why World Health Organization has identified electromagnetic pollution as possibly carcinogenic, something which can cause cancer. And since electronic gadgets are proliferated so much, every country and every individual is susceptible to that. So we did some work to see that how aluminum, which is currently used for electromagnetic shielding in the phones and everything, compares with magnesium. And we found that in both the radio wave frequency and the microwave frequency, magnesium is better or similar than aluminum with a similar value of the mechanical properties. So why should I should not I go for magnesium? Because it makes my phone lighter and I'm replacing a toxic element with a non-toxic element. And that's where the Samsung phones are made of aluminum casings. And many other phones, you will see that many of the light laptops they are all made of magnesium. But how many of uh, us know that it is made of magnesium? That is a big question. So magnesium is in the group 2A of the periodic uh, table. It has many positive. It has a wonderful melting point, one of the lowest uh, among the useful metallic material. It, is, it has the lightest density at 1.74 gram per cc for a structured material. Wonderful specific strength, wonderful damping capabilities, wonderful electromagnetic shielding. It has acceptable ductility, modulus, and the cost. The negative is that it is electrochemically active. So if you have to use magnesium in the wet environment, you ensure that you coat it. Same way you coat steels with either zinc or some coating. You have to use coated magnesium. To compare the magnesium with the workhorses of the metallic elements like aluminum, titanium and steels, you will see in the picture on your left hand side, it has the lowest density, it is the lowest melting point, it has a similar elastic modulus or the specific modulus when you compare with these elements and its specific strength is only next to titanium. But titanium is five times more expensive than magnesium. Now if you look at the graph on your right hand side you see on the y-axis your strength and the x-axis your density now you see these blue dots here so in this blue dots there's a lot of range of the strength where it overlaps with aluminium titanium steel and nickel so wherever you can use it wherever the weight is the issue you can replace all these heavy elements by magnesium moreover it can be turned into a finished product very fast, so it's economically attractive because your productivity or manufacturability is high for this element. Now comes to the abundancy. Are we short of magnesium? Not really. It is the sixth most abundant element in earth crust. It is the third most dissolved mineral in the sea water. Use the magnesium, dump it in the sea and reclaim it back from the sea. Dump it in the soil, it goes in your dinner plate, you become healthy. That's the idea. Now, if you look at the elemental abundance uh, in the earth, you'll see that it is 12 times more than aluminum. That means if your aluminum can last for 100 years, it can last for at least 1200 years, assuming the same rate of consumption. The highest element by mass is iron. Now, if you go in the universe and you will be surprised that now magnesium is even more than iron. And that is where if humans try to colonize Mars or Moon or any other planet in the future, magnesium technology will always be used there because it's a non-toxic element. It is abundant in the second place where you are going and you can use it. And it is a very, very useful element. And that is why I say that magnesium is the God's own element. Now, if some of you have seen this movie, Finding Nemo, it's a wonderful movie in which you have this clown fish on the left side uh, is uh, Marlene and this is a dory 
and this Marlene is like representing the research community, asking the industrial community, the bluefish, that why you gave up on magnesium? And this fish always have the short term memory loss. So she's replying, it's a 50 years of memory loss. But I hope that we now get out of that memory loss and use this wonderful element. Now to further strengthen your understanding on magnesium, because some people still say, hey, magnesium, it can burn very fast. But that's not the case. It's a very big misunderstanding between the research community. As I shown this image on the left -hand side, the beetle, famous beetle car, used 20 kg of magnesium. It was used way back in 1970 in the engine component. Now these are the hot areas, no issues. General Motor put the magnesium in the boot area. The selling point is very simple, 75% lighter than steel and 33% lighter than aluminum. Porsche in 2015 started using magnesium in the rooftop area, which is this area. And just by doing that, they saved 10 kg of the weight of the car. And they compared with aluminum and carbon fiber reinforced plastic and they found that magnesium gives you the best option. South Korea has done a wonderful job to create a whole roadmap of using magnesium. They have used in the wheels area. Maruti Suzuki is already using the steering wheel and Hyundai may be using it in the lamp casing and all this thing. So now if you really see that there are many areas in the car which can be replaced by magnesium and being replaced by magnesium. I've only given you certain examples. But such kind of awareness has not still reached with the Indian researchers so far. So apparently even in the USA, they want to increase the use of magnesium from 5 kg today in a car, which is 2010 reference point, to 160 kg by 2020, about 3200% increase. Now, India is a place where the land is cheap, where the manpower is cheap when compared to the advanced countries. Part of the work is done in India for major auto sector. You have seen that Tesla is also coming to India now. What if they want Indian researchers to create magnesium component? And that is where the billions of dollars of market can be lost if we do not develop this capability at our earliest. Now let's try to have a look at the aerospace sector. 1947, we are seeing use of magnesium in the aerospace sector in the Convair air aircraft in the B-36 Peacemaker with 8.6 tons of magnesium way back in 1949. Sikorsky helicopter used it, Lockheed FADC almost fully made of magnesium. You have Russian bomber 1.5 tons of magnesium. So these are only very few examples which show that magnesium is always used in the defense sector and slowly in 2015 the researchers convinced the FAA, Federal Aviation Authority, to use magnesium in the commercial sector also. And the logic was simple that for a Airbus uh, A380, for example, you can save 4.2 tons of magnesium uh, by weight if you replace the aluminum seats where we sit when we fly by magnesium seats. That's all they have to do. And plus, there are many other opportunities. And now since everyone has to reduce the carbon footprint, so now many countries, including Singapore, is trying to redesign these seas to be put into the commercial planes. Now, how about the maritime sector? Amphibious vehicles, for example, in the US are already using magnesium because you, if you burn less fuel, you can be in the war zone for a longer time. It's very simple logic. It is already used in the engine application in the cruise ships, many of the cruise ships. The countries, uh, 5 million country like Singapore is already trying to put it in the armed robotic vehicles. Concept is very simple. For a 25 tons armed robotic vehicle, you save 3.75 tons, which is 15% saving. So you use less fuel and stay in the war zone for a longer time. I've already given you the example of uh, Samsung phone using magnesium casing it is being used in the camera casing it is also being used in the slowly coming in the tv casing also it is going to come in the robotics it's still people are working in that japanese people have already planned to replace the sleeper birds in the high speed trains by magnesium they have 
done the system level testing. Now, if you go to the Indian Railway, for example, what we see is a cast iron bars. They are very heavy. And if they are heavy, they burn much more fuel. So that is something we have to learn and adapt and move forward. So after this application, now I'll go in the slightly research part in, on the processing technique that we developed. Any metal can be processed using two ways, liquid method or the powder metallurgy method. Now the focus here is magnesium and one of the work we do is in the composite materials. I'm showing you many reinforcement types which we have used to develop composite material. This is what is known as a disintegrated metal deposition technique which we developed in 1995. You see a crucible here. You put the material in there. You, uh, you switch on your uh, radiation heating or resistance furnace. You homogenize the uh, reinforcement as well as temperature and you bottom pour it. And when the melt is pouring down, you hit with the argon gas jets. So your metal is split it into small droplets. And once that happens, your heat transfer increases. When your heat transfer increases, your microstructure gets refined and you get a billet. And a typical facilities that we use is shown here actually, uh, which can be, it's very cheap actually. Anyone can do that. So you can get the ingot like that. You can machine it into a billet. You can extrude in the rod. Now we have also upscaled this technique to 20 kg but magnesium being very light, 20 kg means you can get a five foot high billet, maybe about a foot in diameter. So it's very big for the industrial level. Other way in which you make materials, the powder metallurgy route in which you can take the metal powder or metal with the reinforcement, you blend it, you compact it, and then you sinter it. Traditionally, people use a tube furnace to do the sintering, but we developed microwaves in our lab way back in 2004. Now here, what happens is that why we use microwave? These are the simple microwave that you may be having in your home. We we just created setup of a crucible outside, a crucible inside, silicon carbide receptor here, and we put the metallic billet in the center and close everything by insulation so that the temperature does not go out and spoil the electronics of the microwave. Now you can pre-calibrate this one minute, 100 degrees centigrade, two minutes, maybe 180 degrees centigrade. So you know exactly if you want to reach 640, for example, in our case, we need 14 minutes. Now it's very simple. Once you switch on the microwave, it heats the susceptor and also the billet from inside out and the susceptor heat outside to inside. So there's a two-way heat front which help you in reducing the heating time or sintering time by 90% and the energy levels by also 90%. By doing these things, let's try to see energy consumption. 90% you save, so you're burning less fossil fuel, you're using less electricity and all this thing. So you're helping the climate. When you reduce the heating duration by 90 minutes, that means now within one hour time, or for a given unit time, your productivity increases by similar level. So that is the advantage of microwave sintering. And it's very cheap. You use the same oven that you use it in your home. You can get the billet and you can extrude it and process it. Now, all these materials and methods are okay, but the property should be good. Otherwise, there's no point. So one of the material that we focus on for quite some time is the development of nanocomposites beside the conventional alloys. Uh, the nanocomposite is, is very simple. You can either convert the matrix grain size into the nanoland scale or you just reduce the reinforcement size to nanoland scale. Either way, it will be called as nanocomposite. We use the approach of reducing the size of the reinforcement to the nanoland scale. And what you see on the picture on your right hand side is a small AL203 particles of about 50 nanometer size and the big particles you see on the left hand side. So what is the problem with the big particles or the micron size particle is that when you apply the tensile load, this particle breaks or they debond. So once they break or debond, you apply the stresses on that and your material fail prematurely. Your ductility is comprised, co compromised by 80% and your toughness is also equivalently compromised. So you are not able to realize good properties of your material. 
So using the nano reinforcement is very important because in case of magnesium, it helps in improving the ductility, modulus, dynamic properties, high temperature stability, creep properties, wear properties, fatigue, dry and wet corrosion resistance, ignition, electromagnetic interference, and the bioresponse. Now I'll give you some example. For example, we were able to put aluminum as a reinforcement in magnesium where we did not allow aluminum to dissolve or convert into intermetallic. And if you look at this row with the red font size, you can see that you can al almost increase the yield strength by 50 to 80 percent. You can improve the UTS by 20 to 30 percent and you can also improve the failure strain. So increase in strength plus ductility is possible by using nano land scale, not by the micron land scale so easily. You can also put the ceramic reinforcement, like you put the boron carbide in magnesium and you see that if you look at the red fonts here, the last row with 1.74 boron carbide, again you are seeing an improvement in the strength, improvement in the UTS and also a doubling up of the ductility. If you want the triple the ductility at 17%, put 1% of boron carbide. And not only the tensile properties, you can see an improvement, simultaneous improvement of the strength and ductility in case of magnesium. Not in all the cases, but there are many systems which shows all this kind of simultaneous improvement. Now here is a system where we develop an alloy with magnesium, zinc, gadolinium, and one calcium. You see these properties, 260, 585 UCS failure strain is 12%. Anything more than 10% is, is, is quite reasonable. And with the grain size, which is at 1.42. What is the importance of these numbers? Because these numbers exceeds the properties of WE43 magnesium alloys, which FAA has approved for aerospace application. So you can use this material, which is much cheaper than WE43 and use it. If you put nano reinforcement like zinc oxide, now you look at the improvement in the yield strength by 100 megapascal, another 100 megapascal goes in the UCS, and your failure strain is compromised, but still more than 10%. So what are the importance of these numbers now? Because now these numbers are better than mild steels. So now you can replace mild steel with magnesium-based material, and that gives you 75% weight saving. So we also did some fatigue properties, the failure of material under cyclic loading. There I work with Professor Shivatsam, who is an emeritus professor in University of Akron. I gave him two sets of sample, commercial magnesium alloy AZ31 with CNT. Again, the strength goes up, goes up, and the ductility in this case also goes up. And if you look at this SN curve on the top, for a given stress level, the number of failure cycle are more for composite material. Similar observations were made for AZ31 with AL203. Once again, for a given stress level, the number of cycles to failure for the composite is much higher. So not only under the static loading, but also in the cyclic loading, your properties are going up. And how about the dynamic loading? Where I work with some of my colleagues who are expert in the split Hopkinson bar, where we try to test the materials at high strain rate up to times over three per second. Now focus on this blue curve, which is monolithic material, and the black curve, which is the nanocomposite. So when you apply the high strain rate loading, your composite increases the strength and also shows higher ductility. These properties are very important for transportation sector because when you enter into a collision and your system shows higher strength, that means your survivability of the passengers and the driver in the car is much higher. So this is something which transportation sector looks into. Then some of the time we may need to use a material at a higher temperature. So we did some work in collaboration with Professor Ashish Malik in ISM Dhanban. And we realized that from 25 to 250, typically the nanocomposite shows a strength which is 1.5 times that of the monolithic material. So in a way, your reliability and durability of the material is better if you use a nano reinforcement. We also did some creep testing with uh, partners in Germany, uh, Professor Holt and Hajo, and we gave them the material of magnesium phytin to etium with and the nano composite. And once again, you can see the strands are going up, and in this case, the ductility is also going up. And when they did the creep studies, the blue curve shows that the creep response of nanocomposite is better.
Then another application of materials, metal-based materials is in the sliding application like oil and gas sector and in the transportation sector, you have this uh, piston sliding against and all this thing. So if you put AL203 by just by 1.5%, you get a 25% improvement in the travelogical performance or the wear resistance. If you compositionally modify by adding some calcium, you can get another 25%. So in a three life cycle, you save the cost of a component, which is a significant cost. If you talk of the millions of vehicles, for every element to use in any application, it needs to be machined. So our initial work 20 years back was done with IIT Delhi, Professor Aravindan there, and he was interested in seeing whether how this material behave for machining deep aspect ratio holes. You can see the image here, deep aspect ratio holes, and this is no problem, we can do it, no abnormal arcing, and the surface softness is also at minimum. Then we gave some more samples uh, about 10 years back to University of Newcastle in UK and Singapore, and they found that the cutting forces for all the composites, nano composites are smaller except for one exception. That means your machining can be done faster. If your machining can be done faster, your product gets cheaper because you need less manpower now, or manpower hours. Now all the materials have to be used in the dry condition or wet condition or both. So the dry condition study is done up to 470 degrees centigrade shows that addition of aluminum oxide, the weight loss or weight change is always less than monolithic material. And that can be attributed to its ability to refine the microstructure leading to a fine and compact oxide layer which is a barrier layer. Now development of more productive barrier layer is also established by Australian researchers almost at the same time when they say that when you reduce or define the microstructure then the stainless steel corrosion resistance goes up. Then we did some salt water corrosion resistance with late Professor Balasubramaniam in IIT Kanpur and he indicated that putting 1.5% of AL203 or nano reinforcement can reduce the rate of corrosion by one third and that he attributed to the reduction in the cathodic precipitates in the microstructure. So we have done a lot of work like that and uh, what you see is a bubble chart where your y-axis is the yield strength and the x-axis is ductility and it shows the collection of data of whether you want to use metallic reinforcement, hybrid reinforcement, ceramic reinforcement, liquid metallurgy, powder metallurgy. You can choose as an engineer that what is the strength you're looking for, what is the ductility you're looking for and once you know these two numbers you can choose the material and use it not only the material, the processing type also. Very interestingly, the addition of nano reinforcement also increased ignition temperature of magnesium, which is at 580 degrees centigrade. And just by putting 2% of SiO2, it increased by 30 degrees centigrade. The reason, the physics we do not know, but we know that thermal, conduct, uh, thermal conductivity goes down. And when the thermal conductivity goes down, the ignition resistance is increased. Biomaterial, as I have already indicated to you that magnesium is a nutritional element and now we are using what is called as bioresorbable non-permanent implant. We don't want to use magnesium in the knee or hip because we want that implant to be permanent in the body. But we don't want the screws and nails which goes with the bone fracture to stay in the body because in the long run they either toxify the body or you have to remove it if you, if you have not removed it. And we need implants in most of the bodies, most of the parts of the body in case of uh, fracture, damage, injuries, and so on and so forth. So we tested a number of nano composites with the biocompatible element where we are putting in the body. And first thing we did was to see that whether the property of this composite system is better than the mechanical properties of the bone, which is at 149 megapascal tensile strength. And all the properties that we got was higher than that. The ductility of the bone is between one to two and all the ductilities we get was higher. Similarly, the compressive properties were superior. So these are the mechanical properties. But when you put in the body, it's the biomechanical properties. So we have to do the corrosion testing in the physiological medium. There are many of them. And when we talk with the surgeon, they say that this corrosion rate has to be less than 0.2 millimeter per year. And all these things, what we use, they show the corrosion rate of less than 0.1 millimeter per year, which is acceptable. So having said that, 
does it mean that all MGTIO2 system or MGTIC system or MGTIN system will fit the bill? Yes, they may fit the bill, but we don't want the pH fluctuation which is shown on the y-axis too much in our body, in the microenvironment. So basically, if I take this last point at 2.5%, I know that I can get very good mechanical properties and the pH fluctuation is also very less. If I use TIC as a reinforcement, I choose 2% and if I use TIN as a reinforcement, again, I choose 2% of that. So we are also working with some doctors here in the hospital where they want to use this magnesium nanocomposite for mandibular reconstruction. So first thing they want to see is that can the cell grow on that? So if the cell growth is more than 75%, that means it is called as 0% cytotoxicity and it is allowed for the medical use. So that's only one example and we are taking it to the market now. Now, Another very important application of magnesium is for replacing plastics. You will be surprised that 14 million tons of microplastic litter the ocean floor. That is a finding of Australian researcher just the last year. And American researchers have shown that plastics have already entered our food plate. So it doesn't matter if you are a vegetarian or non-vegetarian. It is already in, on your food plate. So what is a microplastic? Microplastic is a plastic which is less than 5 millimeter in dimension. Now. It can enter your bloodstream, lymphatic system, and even liver. Where do you find this? In your tap water, in the soft drink, salt, beer, oceans, insects, fishes, and birds. PP and PET are the most common type of plastic which are seen in our all these places which I'm showing. What happens if you're purely vegetarian? Yes, if the size of microplastic is less than 2.5 micron, it can breach the transportation system of plants and it has been found in carrots, lettuce, broccoli, potatoes, apples, and practically everything. What happens if the plastic gets accumulated in the body, where the work is still going on? It can lead to cancer, it can weaken your immune system, reproductive problem, nervous systems, and the hearing loss. So it's not a good news. So we are try trying to develop elements by composition design. And what you see in this image are the two pure magnesium which settles at the bottom of the water tank. And this is one is floating in the water. The density of plastic is about 1.5 gram per cc. That's our benchmark. So if we can take this magnesium at around 1.5, it will float. That means it's light. It can replace plastic in many defense application or temperature sensitive application. It can replace plastics. And if we can make it float, it may find many more applications. So that is a work in progress. So now, what is the trend? Uh, of the world. I've shown you all these applications and future direction. One of the indicator which was also in, indicated in the ranking of uh, NIIT Trichy also is the publications. How do you get publication? For publication, you have to get funding. And when you get the funding, the funding body asks you to publish. So basically, if you see here, that the number of papers on the y-axis are going up in magnesium continuously over the last 10 years. That shows that a lot of companies are investing in magnesium to be used in application. You've seen many applications, it is there, but you don't see many things in the public domain because it becomes a trade secret of the company. But sooner or later, we will use it. So it's very important that we harness the potential of this wonderful element for our country, India, where the awareness is still not very high. People are now waking up to that, but they have not taken enough action as other countries like China, which controls 85% of the magnesium now, uh, and South Korea, which already has a wonderful plan, Germany, which is already like making tremendous progress in biomedical application, Americans are doing it in the defense application. Canadians are doing an extraction of magnesium using green technology. So I think India has to wake up at the same time in a much more aggressive way. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that this element is a wonderful element. It can be used in many engineering and biomedical application. You have the trillion dollar market there. You do not need investment in the infrastructure. Your conventional infrastructure, which you use for aluminum, for example, you can use it. it the presence of nanoparticles is very interesting 
because it can improve the properties, multiple properties, engineering properties, biomedical properties. The only scary part of this is that industry feels how do we upscale it to 100 kg and all this thing? How do we ensure distribution? But I think once they take a step, the solution can be found. We are also investigating amorphous and hollow reinforcement for certain other set of the properties. So the message is this technology has arrived at the global platform now. Now it's very important for the comment, for the professional bodies, for the universities and the industries to come together and make a difference not in our life, but the life of our future generation. So with this, I conclude the talk with an acknowledgement to all the all my students uh, who have helped uh, in uh, doing what I'm showing to you. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, sir. That was a very interesting lecture. Uh, so we have some questions in our chat box. Yes. So you can read one by one, and I can keep answering one by one. Oh, uh, sure, sir. So uh, Ashwin asks, we usually hear about the circular economy of metals in the context of sustainability. How amenable are magnesium and its alloys to this? Do they have an advantage in this aspect over other metals and alloys? Yeah, as I indicated in the part of my lecture is that you have magnesium both in the earth crust and in the seawater. And I use that statement, you can dump it in the sea after use and you can reclaim back from the sea. So that answers that question. A second question is, so could you please give us examples on the automotive coatings you mentioned earlier? Also, can you comment on the advent and the employment of thin films and metal additive manufacturing on the automotive and aerospace sectors? Okay, uh, magnesium is a lightweight element. So it has to be used as a material for the components. So it is not used as a coating, it is used as a component because then only you can get the weight saving. Now, like any other metallic material, even the steels you use or aluminum you use, they're either coated or painted. So it all depends chemical coating or the physical coating and all this thing. Similarly, for magnesium, you have to do that. There are certain coating system which have been invented already, which used to exist also, which can be applied on magnesium. But having said that, suppose a coating system is developed in Germany and India has the component and he wants to put that coating. You have to pay them the money and you have to pay them a lot of money to use their technology, but they have developed it. So that is where we need to develop the technology for our own local market. So to clarify, once again, magnesium we are using not as a coating, but magnesium we are using as a bulk material to make the components and it needs to be coated for environmental protection. Thank you, sir. Our third question is, how high entropy based magnesium alloys can be instrumental in pollution control versus conventional magnesium alloys and nanocomposites? What might be the drawbacks faced in the process? Uh, that was also part of my lecture that aluminum is neurotoxic and iron is too heavy, 75% heavier than that. So, uh, Iron is not toxic because iron is also present in our body. We need 10 mg of iron there, but because of the fuel saving, which is affecting our climate, we cannot use iron in anything which moves. For static infrastructure adaptation, use it. So magnesium is a way forward actually, because every country, every sector is supposed to reduce the carbon footprint. So in that context, magnesium comes in. I hope I have not missed any part of the question. Uh, no, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, next question is, could you also perhaps comment on the disintegrated melt deposition method in terms of defects in the final component and how they are avoided, if so? Could process modeling studies possibly help with this? Process modeling is always very helpful. In fact, process 
modeling is always used for even the well-established costing methods. What we are using DMD at this point of time is to make the primary billets. Like, for example, if you go to a primary metal industry, aluminum, I was attached to uh, an aluminum plant where the slab they used to make was almost like 10 meters in length and about 5 meters in the width, about a meter in thickness. So imagine how big the castings are made. So DMD can come to do that not to make the final component. So after you make that slab, for example, then you it used to go for rolling, forging, or extrusion. So that so what we are saying is a primary processing. So DMD is a method for primary processing. Secondary processing, which is extrusion, rolling, and forging, that is totally a different ball game. So it can work as a primary processing technique to build materials, what we call the billets or ingot, and supply to the secondary processing industry. And the second part, I think they asked about the defects. Defects is not an issue actually for the pure metals and the alloys and everything. And I will say even better in the lab stage and also up to 20 kg, which we have upscaled uh, compared to any other uh, costing method without any special uh, features to be put during solidification. Because uh, as I indicated that we are dividing or disintegrating the melt stream. So once you disintegrate the stream, you are having multiple solidification center rather than solidification always starting from the surface to the center. So that solidification condition get improved. So the defects does not go up. It actually comes down only. So that is not an issue also. 